Test in one, two, three. Time for ethology. One, two, three. Time for ethology. If anyone can hear me, let me know. Time to teach about David Meech. Waiting for the thumbs up. Give me an audio and visual check and we'll get started. So one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Ethology. Hear and see me, all right. Good to go. Hello everyone and welcome to our stream. Today, what we are going to be learning about is one of my personal favorite subjects is going to be about Dave David Meech's famous 1999 publication called Alpha Status, Dominance, and Division of Labor in Wolf Packs. So what we're going to learn, what our, object our objectives going to be is what is the study most known for? That's number one. Next, we need to know what is being overshadowed in this study and why this information is extremely useful to professional dog trainers. And I can tell you for sure that David Meech's work is like, it is, it is priceless. It is priceless information if you really want to be at the top of your field in dog training. However, the, this publication has mostly been um, exploited in the wrong way, mostly by people that know, know any better. So everything that I teach you, if you go, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you why I think it is important, but like everything else that we learn here is I have the references here. You can go to the study. Please read the information yourself. Make your own interpretations. Be the type of professional that we should be and that we owe to dogs and their owners. So on here, on my notes page, I give, there's a bunch of references over here. First, I want to make sure of anyone who, do, who does not know who David Meech is, that they can find information over here. I'm not going to go on and on about his biology, his, uh, his biography, because you can find it over here on the site. And I gave some links. I actually gave a link to his business site here and to his personal site. I put a nice video I found about him. But David Meech is for sure the most famous um, the, the most famous person there there has been when it comes to studying wolf behavior. He's been researching wolves since 1958 in Minnesota. Um, all, all, all over all over the United States basically. Um, and Canada. So, so his information is definitely prices. Look him up. Go, you go to his Wikipedia page. Know all about him. He has lots of studies. I have lots of his studies right here on the site. But what we're going to do is the link is right over here for, I have the, the study over here. You can, if you go to that link, it's pretty easy to get to this study that we're going to be talking about. All the references are here, all the charts, all the, all the quantitative data is over here. Great study. Now, number one, what is the study most known for? Um, this study came out in 1999 and it is most known for if you search and, and we, we talk about this quite a bit actually on the site because we need to understand dog behavior. We need to understand dog behavior. And then what we're doing is we're looking at their undomesticated version. 
the wolf. We are going to do units on the differences. There's definitely differences between domesticated dogs and their wild counterparts. So we are going to get to that. But this study, you want to know it because it has really important differences. Um, it's going to give us important information that helps explain why our domesticated dogs do certain behaviors. And it helps us to get an ac accurate information as to why they do certain behaviors. Now, what it is most known for is mostly about semantics and the word alpha. So if you look up anything on the on the internet about, if you just Google alpha in dog training or alpha wolf, anything like that, you are gonna come, there's endless articles that are gonna talk about the alpha myth has been debunked, dominance has been debunked in dog, in, 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 in dog training or in wolves and all of these kind of things. It will drive you crazy trying to go through the information. So what I'm asking you to do is do your, what you need to know. All this information is, being, is based off of this study. So just watch this, um, listen, uh, sorry, sorry guys. What I want you to do is read the study. Look, at, I'm gonna give you information to look for form your own opinion, all right? Don't follow rhetoric. I put some other links. I put a video on here about dominance and the importance of understanding what it really is about. Also common rhetoric that is paired with this information is that besides um, alpha, that the whole idea of an alpha wolf is, is a myth, is also dominance, is not a significant concept in dog training. Also using wolf behavior to interpret dog behavior is like using chimpanzees to understand human behavior. You'll find this in articles and videos by YouTubers. Form your own opinion. Some quick notes and giving you just some facts to make things easier for you and insert in some of my opinion, form your own opinion, is... Um, I actually like anthropology. I used to work with chimpanzees, just for your information. When you hear anything about comparing wolves to dogs is like comparing humans to chimpanzees. Remember that dogs are domesticated wolves, right? They're domesticated wolves. They're considered the same subspecies. They're, they're considered the same, they're actually subspecies of, of a wolf. They breed together. As a trainer, you often have to help people with hybrids. Um, they've only been they've been domesticated about 14,000 years ago is what scientists agree upon for the most part. This is a pretty common thing. And for sure, from an ethology point of view, and when you look into the science, for sure, ethologists look at wolves to understand certain dog behavior. Right. You have to read the studies yourself to see that where chimpanzees, we diverge from a common ancestor. 8 million years ago. 8 million years ago, we're not even in the same genus, never mind species. We're definitely not domesticated chimpanzees. And we and we have we're we're very, 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 very different. All right. So that's all we have to say about that. But form your own opinion about it. Um, now, other things too, just so we know, so we don't have to spend too much time on it. Even David Meech himself, I put a quote over here and a link to the article on psychology today. Um, he even wrote that the misinterpretation and total misinformation, like Kelly's, he's referring to an article about dominance debunked, has plagued me for years now. I do not in any way reject the notion of dominance. And I have put links to all of these studies are on the site. Matter of fact, even after this groundbreaking study, um, the concept of uh, of dominance is is center to a lot of his studies because it's such an important trait in understanding the wolf behavior. It's the title of a lot of his studies, right? We got from Lee, you know, I got here this one he published um, next year, which we're actually going to learn about this one next um, ne next class. But in all of these, I put quotes. He's freely talking about dominance and 
and leadership and how, you know, leadership behavior in relation to, to, to dominance. This one, 10 years after the 1999 one, this one was in 2010, prolonged intensive dominance behavior between gray wolves. Matter of fact, the first sentence in the study is dominance is one of the most pervasive and important behaviors among wolves in a pack. So he in no way in studying wolf behavior believes that dominance is not some is something that's not important to study or to understand. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. And last last thing that I want to mention before we get into this is this is not a lecture about training techniques. When we talk about dominance in the study, we are not talking about a training technique. We're clear we just learning about what it is, understanding what it is when it comes to the wolf pack and how this can potentially relate to to dog training, how we can use this information to how to, how to troubleshoot things in dog training. So now we're going to get to what I believe is the important behavior, right? If, um, if what is being overshadowed mostly by what I feel is semantics is, is what are the important things that there are to learn in this study? Now, the number one thing that there is to learn, and this is really what David Meech was trying to put out there. And I have, you know, these are, these are photos right from the study itself, is that in captive packs, the unacquainted wolves form dominance hierarchies feature in alpha, beta, omegas, etc., which such assemblages, these dominance labels, were probably appropriate. For most species thrown together in captivity, would usually so arrange themselves. So if you're watching this stream, ideally you watch the shankle streams, and the shankle streams, which Dave Meech refers to um, often inside of inside of this study is based off of captive wolves so he is restating within this study that when in captive environments with unrelated especially adult wolves thrown together you're going to get these dominance hierarchies that are that that generally come together and are settled through conflict and aggression and things like that, which we covered in the streams before this. So refer to the, to the Shankle studies. But what David Meech found through many, many years observing wolves in their natural environment is that it doesn't really go like that, right? That, that wolf packs are generally a family. They're generally a family that consists of the breeding pair, a male and a female, and their offspring. The offspring tend to stay into the, in the pack on average about two years. Almost all of them leave by the time they're three years of age, and then they go and they make their own packs. You know, they search for a mate, they, they find a mate, they have their own families, and they inherit becoming the alpha or the dominant wolf. Um, he, and remember a lot of this, the lot, a lot of the focus on this study was about the, sem the semantics of it, which is just the word alpha. Um, so he chooses, he does not say alpha is not a real word in the study. He said there's times, and we covered this in the other streams that there are definitely appropriate times to use the word alpha, especially when there's multiple breeding breeding pairs in a very in a very large pack but he says that it just gives us more information when we talk about the breeding pair or the parent wolves because they inherit it they automatically they automatically become the the most dominant wolves inside of the group just by becoming parents and that was really the point that he was trying to make that there was no fighting going on how they become leader how they become the dominant, the dominant pair is inherited. And because you got to remember, you always have to remember what people are doing, why they're doing things. Dave Meech is, he, he is an advocate for wolves. And one of the things he wanted to do is, is remove this impression 
that wolves are these super aggressive animals that are constantly fighting each other. He really wanted to represent them more as a family unit that we can relate to, which they, you know, we're obviously not the same as wolves, but that is one of the that is one of the similarities that we have with canines is they is they do naturally form family units that are very similar to ours. And it's not set in stone, just like humans. You know, sometimes you get these extended families too. So it varies a bit. But in general, in general, as a rule, the vast majority of, of, of natural packs resemble human families. Parents and a couple of generations. You know, usually it seems like no more than like three generations. Like pups, yearlings, and sometimes wolves that are two to three years of age and then they start dispersing right so so that's part is being over is overshadowed now why this is important is us as dog trainers is if we are dealing we're often dealing we're not just doing obedience training right we're helping people troubleshoot issues and we get phone calls from people that sometimes have lots of dogs that come together of different ages, similar sexes, like all kinds of things. And we we need one of the things that we're doing with the clients is we're is we're trying to educate them so they form the right attitudes about their dog. So they don't think that their dogs are just crazy or they're being jerks or something like that. It's when we have canines together and it's more similar to like a refugee camp in humans where we just have a bunch of adults put together, we're going to have different types of conflict compared to if we have something that resembles something that would be more natural even for humans like a male and a female living together or a male and a female and and children or something like that so it helps explain why we're going to get certain conflicts and some of this is explained too in this study in the study he does talk about that most young wolves disperse when they're about one to two years of age, right? And few remain beyond three years of age. In captivity, when wolves are forced to stay together after that age and they become adults, right? This is like a teenager that stays home with their parents and is going to live there until like they're 30 years old. A lot of times you're going to get the mother and daughter button heads more or the father and the son button heads. We have more conflict when when they don't disperse. And you'll be troubleshooting often with clients where they have a dog, they bring home a pup and everything is fine. Everything is fine and then you start to get issues when the pup is like two years of, two years of age. Often with, um, with a same sex adult, adult dog in there, all right? So, so this, is, this study will give us significant insight of why we may have issues at certain times in the development process of our domesticated domesticated version. Um, next is what's really cool about this study is this whole idea, and you'll see lots of literature of, of this about predicting alpha dogs. When someone looks at a litter of puppies and they determine which one is gonna, which one would be an alpha dog if it was in, a wild pack or even with wolves where you can determine if there's a litter of wolf puppies, which one is going to be a leader of the pack and which one is going to be a follower. When, when we were, when all we had was shankel studies and we were just studying captive wolves that were living together and they never dispersed. Yes. If we look at other studies, which we'll look at in the future and with domestic dogs and stuff like that and temperament tests, is yes, there's definitely different personality types that canines have, even within the litter. And some are definitely more assertive. And, and when we talk about dominance hierarchies, we can definitely get a little hierarchy even within even within puppies, groups of groups of puppies. Although that is not that is not in this study, right? In this study, he does not he does not mention or he didn't have enough information to determine if there's hierarchies even within the puppies. But there are other studies that will that will do that that talk about this. Um, 
But the important point here is that in the natural environment, all the puppies, as long as they live long enough, they all end up dispersing. They usually end up dispersing and they all do become alpha or the most dominant wolf in their own packs automatically when they become parents. All right. So again, you could relate this to humans um, where it doesn't matter what a human's personality type is, even within their own family or with their own siblings, or if they're usually following rather than leading. Um, norm normally, most people go and they find a significant other. And if they have children, they automatically become the alpha, which that sounds so funny, right? The alpha over children. That's why David Meech did not like use the word you use the word alpha. How now this is also significant when it comes to us as dog trainers because it shows that it's not inherent. If you're helping someone to pick a puppy, it definitely does. You will see it definitely makes a difference when we get to that part of the course about the temperament of the puppy and certain puppies are definitely going to be easier for certain families based on certain temperament tests. But it does not mean if you pick a certain puppy that this puppy is going to automatically, based on some temperament test, automatically be an alpha with some other dogs that you put it with. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that a dog is automatically, depending on how it relates to to other puppies automatically be submissive to, to, to other dogs is all of them can potentially be in a dominant position or a submissive um, position based on other factors. Okay. Um, next scent marking scent marking. He, have, he has found watching the natural wolves um, um, that it coincided what was what has also been seen in multiple studies with with captive wolves that generally both the breeding male and breeding female scent mark and they can also double scent mark meaning one marks first and the one marks marks in the same spot and it does not matter what order that they do it and one may do first one may do the other one and it is very very um it's it's very consistent that only the the breeding pair or the most dominant male and female in a pack scent mark and never any of the any of the the pups or or yearlings or or two-year-olds or any of the other ones that are that that are not not breeders so that can give us insight when we are going to be troubleshooting problems within the home, such as housebreaking issues. For example, I have fixed a lot of housebreaking issues where a client's dog was marking within the house, lifting its leg and peeing within the house simply by troubleshooting the way the dog felt and what its role was inside of the household, as opposed to like just looking at that behavior or marking and trying to do something to stop the behavior itself. Instead of going to the source, going to mother nature and address the motivation behind why the dog feels that it has to mark within the home. So this gives us reference that this is a natural behavior. We always want to work with mother nature and not against it. Um, next, so much in this study, there's so much in this study over here is food ownership, resource guarding. This is one of my, again, th I, this is something too that is overshadowed all this talk about this groundbreaking study and Everything has to do about semantics and, and, and generalizations about what those semantics apply. And not all this good stuff over here. Um, food ownership. To my, to my, actually, no, this was also, he does reference that, that we've seen this also. Jesus. 
wolves in their natural environment that defending food once the food is in the ownership zone meaning any wolf in the pack it doesn't matter if it's a puppy or if it's one of the the parents if they have a piece of food already and it's around their mouth they all in his observation there's no correlation between that and their status that all wolves will guard their food from any other pack members. And it has nothing to do with status. So therefore, this is important. Again, when we're helping someone and they bring home that puppy and the puppy is guarding its food, you do not want to say this dog thinks it's the boss or the dog thinks it's alpha or the dog is dominating you. All right? That's not what it is. If we try to make a plan based off of we think that this puppy or this dog, its motivation is because it thinks it's the boss or leading or dominating or 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 all these things, it's gonna go, it's not gonna be the right plan. It's not gonna write it's it's not gonna be the right plan. You often will end up doing things that could make the problem worse if you think about it that way. And instead of going with mother nature. So we're not going to talk about fixing food ownership, you know, um, resource guarding in this lecture. We just want to understand the natural behavior of canines. And we will talk about when we go into domestication and selective breeding. Yes, that some dogs naturally were selectively bred to have less of this instinct. But naturally, undomesticated version, food garden is a natural behavior that does not mean the dog wants to be the boss or anything like that. He also, besides um, showing, you know, giving a little chart over here where he recorded, um, I, he also mentions in the study one incident where while a, you know, while the, the female wolf was being, the, was being submissive to, to the male wolf, um, she was holding a bone. And even when, even though she was acting submissive to the to the male, that the male, let me see, I'll just read right from him. It says, for example, during one of the 1998 meetings, the female posture toward the male is described above, which is a submissive posture, referring to Shankle's work. While she possessed a long bone from which she had just eating much, the male, which had not fed for at least several hours, attempted to take the bone. However, the female snapped defensively at him and successfully retained the bone despite repeated attempts by the male over a one hour period to steal it. So he also um, gives an incidence over there where the female, which in his recordings was definitely um, submissive to the male, was successfully defended, you know, protected her bone from the from, from the male. Which brings us to another interesting fact over here. Is actually I'll, I'll bounce around. I'm gonna go down here. Is um, that in the in the Shankle studies or all the captive wolf studies, it was formerly believed that there was mostly two separate hierarchies. That it was the males had their own hierarchy, and the females had their own hierarchy, and there really wasn't any real competition um but there wasn't much of a hierarchy related to the male the male and the female which in a natural environment because they get to separate you know they, they separate and they go different places when they're hunting or foraging and come back together you get to see more greeting behavior and what he has what he did witness in the natural environment is that the female dominated all the males and females. The dominant male dominated all the wolves in the pack, male and female, um, except for the breeding male. And the breeding male, the breeding male was dominant over the whole pack. And also, and this was where the title division of labor comes from, is they tend to work, they, they really work together. And, and there's going to be big differences in this when we go into domesticated dogs. So don't necessarily relate this to domesticated, domesticated dogs, or at least your average domesticated dog, is that um, 
is, you know, during when the female has pups, especially when they're very young and she is not um, removing herself from the den often, the, the hierarchy seems to flip-flop, meaning it's the only time the male is generally consistently submissive to the female is when she has the the pups which is which is very interesting again you can go into the details when you read through the the study your yourself all right so the male usually for a few weeks will be submissive to the female and the rest of the time generally um everyone submits to the to the male and referring back to, if we use as a base, Schenkel's work on submission and also all of Meech's references, is you're definitely seeing the hierarchy is definitely um, reinforced more through submission than dominance displays, all right? Assertive dominance displays. So over here, jumping around, um, is... On dominance, right? We're talking about dominance, but not talking about dominance, is what he really means by dominance. Is read the study, and I also put, you know, put uh, pieces of the study right over here. When we talk about dominance, generally, if I'm troubleshooting with people and their dogs, because you hear, the word dominance is thrown around so much and it's become like a bad word now. Um, become a bad world, a bad word in commercial dog training a lot. A lot of times because of misinterpretations of this study. Dominance in the study and most, pretty much any paper you see on wolves um, um, in ethology is is mostly about control of limited resources. So in wolf, when we talk about wolves, often dominance gives the right to breeding. So that's why the most dominant wolf is dominant wolves or the breeding male and, and the breeding female. And the rest, the only thing, the only things that are important are mostly like food and control and, and control on the food. And this is where you mostly where anything that involves dominance mostly has to do with the food. So, and there's very interesting things with within the study. Um, for example, it's not, we hear all these things about in order to be dominant, where right? we get these generalizations that you have to eat first, you have to, you have to, you know, do everything first, first, first. We're going to go into dominance is not going to be the same as leadership. It's something completely different that we have to do a whole nother. We're going to do a whole nother stream. I'm going to hit that one next week. So leadership is mostly about making the decisions for the group, right? Initiating things. When are things are going to happen? Dominance is just really first right over limited resource and control and limited resource. And if you learn it this way, I promise you. It's going to be so much easier to diagnose what's going on when you're troubleshooting behavior problems within a home and to offer solutions that do not go against mother nature. So, so in his studies that he saw that mainly the most dominant wolves are just controlling the food and that in no way means that they're always necessarily eating first, that they're often taking the food and bringing it, you know, the male will bring the food to the female. They bring it, they give it to who needs it most. Often they're giving the pups the food first and then they may eat. Then they may give the, 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 the yearlings the food. But it's all about just controlling the food and first right to it. And not something general like they eat first and the most and, and then the and then like the second strongest wolf eats is not like this linear thing all right they just choose who's going to eat and when and it's not about being first very important again when we, if we want to incorporate mother nature into households that have have dogs all right you don't need people to worry about that they need to eat before their dogs or they need to feed this one first before the other one. Generally, you're going to see 
when we do discuss incorporating this into our life with dogs, it's really just being about controlling it, you know, choosing when they're going to eat, who's going to eat, and very similar to what we see in, in Mother Nature. And he mentions that. He mentions that in the study. He mentions it even like in the in the conclusion. So he says dominance displays are uncommon, except during competition for food. Then they allow parents to monopolize food and allocate it to their youngest offspring. Active submission, which we learned about in Schenkel, appears to be primarily a food bag and gesture or food gather and motivator. The role of active and passive submission submission and interactions between the breeding male and female when no offspring are present needs further exploration. So that was, so when it comes to dominance, it's not, you don't see it. It's not like the, in the Schenkel, you know, in the, in the Schenkel studies where we saw a lot more dominance going on. When we have things, if, if we manage, when dogs, canines are living in a natural way, there's not a lot of dominance displays. Um, it's mostly friendly gestures submissive displays and when you do see dominance displays is usually over the allocation of food which is very easy to stay in control of when you own when you own dogs um and let's see captive two separate hierarchies and that is the important parts of the study i know i tried to go through very quickly with this because I did not want to drag this one on for a long period of time. But if you go to this page, I have all the links over here. I have all the links over here. And what we're going to do next is we're going to work on leadership, understanding Meech's stuff is just, it's just, it's gold. We're going to do Here's the link, Alpha Status Dominance and Division of Labor in Wolf Packs. We are going to, where did I do them? Over here. Um, leadership in Wolves. His, his, he did the next year. He specifically addressed leadership. Then he even addresses leadership in relation to dominance and reproductive status in Gray Wolves. So just so you know, we have to, we are going to, this builds upon understanding leadership. Dominance is relevant canine behavior, but we need to understand it. So if we understand what dominance is, which is, de is not designed for violence, all right, it's designed to reduce conflict, to make, to, for allocating for so you know as a tool to, to help a whole pack or family unit survive very similar to parents right that are feeding their kids and who gets to eat what and when um, it is an important concept that we need to understand that is not a training technique it's something that we need to understand which is good it is it is a good thing reduces violence reduces stress when it comes to dogs once we know that we can then learn about leadership, which we're going to see. Just to give you a hint, it's all about making the decisions of when things when things are going to happen. Again, it is for the good for the group. Leadership is not a training technique. It is designed to for 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 harmony and to work to work as a group. And again, they're not to have be conflict. And then we want to compare. You know, are they completely related to each other? You know, is leadership and dominance one and the same? Or can we have a separation of the two? So that's what we have in the future. So that will be it for today's stream. If there are any major questions, you could put them in the chat now. But if not, I will address... Further questions first on our Q&A session on Wednesday. And until Wednesday, hope everyone enjoys the rest of their weekend. And I will see you soon. But I'll hang out in the pack howl for a bit if, in case there's any questions after I end the, the stream.